thanks for having me here. I am happy to be your last speaker. I'll try to keep it fun so you can go out with, uh, with a bit of a bang. So uh, today we're going to talk um, about um, basically how to find failures. So one of the things I like to do in my spare time is basically watch robots not do what they're supposed to do and fail in sort of fantastic ways. Um, and often when you look at internet videos and things of robots failing, it seems like this is something that happens all the time. Um, however, we'll look at cases basically where, um, assuming we have a relatively well-defined or well-designed system, um, how can we actually find failures so we can do a deeper assessment and hopefully correct them before we really release them out into the world? So again, today we'll basically be talking about how we can take these different robots in some different contexts and how we can really search the system and find failures um, in that. And a lot of the work that, we'll be, um, that I'll be presenting today has been done by two of my graduate students, uh, Peter Du and Tian Chen Ji, as well as some of the work in collaboration with Anthony and some folks here from, from CISL. All right, so let's kick it off. And if anyone has questions um, as I go along, feel free to raise your hands. We can, we can keep it informal. All right, so let's go ahead. So as a brief introduction, um, again, a little bit about myself. Um, so I run the Humana Centered Autonomy Lab. And what we try and do is basically try to push, um, push the limits of robotics so we can have more collaborative robots that work right alongside people, um, be that in a very sort of collaborative sense um, or in a sense where we just try to save, get our videos to play first off, uh, where these robots need to work on people. And hopefully, for the most part, our videos will work. But um, once this happens, uh, we also, again, we like to assess safety. So when we really think about deployment, we can make sure that these things are going to work as we want, be they working around people or in very close context um, with them. So this is a bit um, sort of an overview of what my lab tries to do. Um, and as you can tell, even in these little pictures here, um, there's a lot of different types of applications that we look at. Um, in particular, we look at things in agriculture. So we look at field robots. Uh, we look at transportation, where we have autonomous vehicles. And as I just mentioned, we have collaborative robots in manufacturing. Now, these are very different areas, and each one has sort of their own nuances. Um, and when we start thinking about safety, this actually becomes very important. Uh, because the tools that we use to assess safety and say the manufacturing sense might be very different from what we do in the field robot sense. So one thing that we can try to start building some intuition on is how do we actually draw some linkage or really think about safety in these very different contexts. So one thing we can note is that between these different applications, we have this sort of notion of increasing structure. And I mean this in a very loose sense. Um, I don't have sort of a very formal thing for this, but it's more of really how we describe this full, this full system. So for example, in the manufacturing case, we usually have a very specific task that we're trying to do. We have a full understanding of that whole process of sort of what we want our system to do and everything there. We also have really good control over that whole environment. So for example, if I know that I need a vision system that works for my manufacturing robot, I can do whatever I need to to make that vision system work as optimally as possible. I can control the light conditions. Um, I even have some control over the workers and what they do. Um, if I'm having a hard time tracking them, I can add things to, to what they do. So there's a lot of sort of structure in how we can design this, this system. Um, on this other end here, if we're looking at like a field robot, even though if you're thinking about something like a robot that's like working on a farm, it seems like there's some structure but in reality, there's actually very little, and it's very hard to understand sort of what's, what's going on in this, this scene. So it becomes very hard to even do some things like define what a failure is in this case. We kind of know what a collision is, but it can be very hard to detect in these really tough, tough environments. So um, in somewhere in the middle here is we have these autonomous vehicles, which have a lot of structure in that we have rules of the road. We have this sort of agreed upon way that we're all going to drive, how we're going to operate, and how things work. However, you will always have sort of these violations in what you expect in your environment. You'll have crazy weather that comes in. You'll have people doing who knows what. So you do have a lot of sort of things that can come in and add to the uncertainty and whatnot there. So depending on these different sort of applications, you can kind of start thinking about the different, um, the different modes of operation and whatnot here. And again, we can start thinking about the different tools that we might need if we want to start analyzing the safety of these systems, again, hopefully prior to, to deployment um, here. And as another sort of quick aside, 
So as we have this sort of increasing structure, this also really changes the type of, um, the type of tasks and sort of the, the expectations of the system themselves. So what we can do is we can add sort of another layer here. And you can start thinking about something like the different sort of expectations of autonomy. So you can think about like the levels of automation or sort of modes of interaction that you might have in these sort of different settings. So the most obvious one for this is thinking about like the levels of autonomy for a um, autonomous vehicle. So in this case, you can have a fully autonomous vehicle. It is fully driving. You kind of know what to expect. And you can kind of design your system around something here. Whereas if you have lower levels of autonomy, where you have, say, you're sharing control with that human, um, this sort of has sort of a different, different thing that you would expect from, from your overall system. And you can say this for, for other, the other applications too. Whereas, again, we have sort of a similar, very high level of autonomy um, for these robots. And this is sort of what is in practice today for manufacturing robots. And actually, often what we're trying to do is sort of bring it down so you can have more collaborative robots. So in many ways, you're trying to make the robots less autonomous, have them work more with people. And again, this is something that you sort of want to bring, bring down here. Um, on the other side here, we can have this person monitoring the single robot, or we can have something where the human is monitoring full fleets. Um, but when you have less structure, you're basically never going to have the same sort of fully autonomous um, system like you would have over here, just because of the nature of the problem. So going back to just this original point, though, we want to sort of think about safety. And we're going to think about it in this sort of notion of structure. So what can we say about the problem? What can we say about sort of what's going on here? And again, how can that inspire how we're going to solve the problem? How we're going to do things like find failures um, in the system? So if we have really well-specified models, you might be able to use more rigorous analysis. You can have formal methods. You can use more analysis-based approaches where you can say, OK, here's the parameters that I have. Here's the model that I'm going to use. And here's basically everything that I can prove or say about my system. However, as we move sort of down to this lower structure, we kind of need to start thinking a little bit more creatively about how we're going to find these tools. So we're going to spend most of our time today talking about these sort of two different applications. So first, we're going to think about simulation-based uh, validation. So this is a case where we have our autonomous vehicle, we have our system, and we actually have a decent idea of how it behaves. But again, we sort of have these um, some special cases or some scenarios where it kind of breaks down. So we have this sort of semi-structured um, environment. However, we can run simulations on it. And that's sort of the key thing here. When we have some idea of what we're going to do, we have some sense of the model, we can kind of build up our simulation um, there. And we can start looking at tools for how we actually find failures in the system. Um, then at the end, we'll talk about this very unstructured case where we can actually uh, we can't really rely on things like simulation to help us find um, failures and sort of understand what's going on. So instead, we can sort of look at proxies for failure detection or these more rigorous approaches um, and just look at like anom anomalous cases. So a little bit more of a pure data-driven uh, perspective here. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about um, today. So let's go ahead and talk about this first case. We'll talk about simulation-based uh, validation, and again, in the context um, of autonomous vehicles. All right, so if I were to give you an autonomous vehicle uh, to control, and let's say that uh, I want you to design the system so it's robust against all kinds of noise or all kinds of uncertainty, let's say um, uh, despite you know, people acting a little bit strange, some noise in your sensors, things like that. So often, if you were to take sort of a more traditional approach, you might cast um, this as a robust decision-making or control problem. And you try to write it something like this, where you have this system that you're trying to control. So it's guided by some dynamics F. So this can be the dynamics that guide your, your vehicle. And you want to find that controller. So again, you want to basically find how you drive this car. Um, and you'll have some disturbances. And this can basically model all of the uncertainties. So hopefully, if you can capture all of this uncertainty, all the disturbances in the world, you can find this controller and you can be safe, safe against them. And that's sort of the intuition behind this robust control or this robust decision-making approach. Um, and this is something that really came about when we started thinking about adding things like sensor noise. Maybe you have some uncertainty in where you are or something um, in your sensors. Maybe you have some uncertainty in, say, like the road friction um, or some detection 
um, uncertainty. Um, and this is sort of really meant for these sorts of these sorts of systems. So again, this is something that's sort of well studied in control. So hopefully you don't violate any constraints. You can basically stabilize and control the system the way the way you want it to. Um, so this is sort of one class of systems that it was like really well or did a really good job handling. Um, however, this has become sort of more popular a little bit more recently as people started thinking about things like model mismatch. Um, so this is still something that people were interested in when they first came about from the control perspective, um, where maybe you have some unmodeled dynamics um, in your system. Um, but this also um, became more popular when people started thinking about, okay, we're training lots of things in the real world or in simulation. We want them to work in the real world. There's going to be some gap between the two of them. You can actually capture some of this through this sort of robust robust decision-making framework. So this came about in the form of things like robust RL, adversarial RL, and things like that, where you kind of tried to handle all of this. Um, and again, one of the big issues, like I mentioned, you have something running in simulation, you have some mismatch between things, and you tend to sort of get this cascading error. So here's sort of an example of things getting worse and worse over time where you have an unstable method. So again, this sort of robust or adversarial approach can help you come up with systems that are more, more robust in this case. Okay, so this is sort of what this was handling, but really when we're thinking about autonomous vehicles deployed in the real world, again, a lot of the issues that we really think about don't really come from things like having like not a good model of your vehicle or um, having some uncertainty in your noise. They often come from something a little bit different. So they often come from things like failures in interaction. So these sorts of methods don't really capture these sort of longer term sorts of scenarios, these longer term interactions that again, are sort of the things that lead to these sort of more interesting um, failures here. So to sort of really push past this point where, okay, we have a system that we can get to work fairly well on the road. We've sort of resolved some of these robustness issues. Now, how do we uh, sort of really actually think about the real issues that happen, the things that they encounter on the road, and how can we start using that sort of to inform how we design the vehicle itself? So to do this, as I sort of hinted at earlier, we're going to turn to this simulation-based um, validation. And part of why we turn to this simulation-based um, validation is because, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's actually kind of hard to find failures. Once you've resolved a lot of these, these issues, these sort of failures are sort of few and far between. So uh, these numbers are a little bit out of date, but they're still relatively, relatively insightful. Um, so when you think about autonomous vehicles um, on the road, um, you have this sort of interesting issue where you have very high risk events. So you have things like collisions. They're actually very rare or sort of low probability um, events. So if you look at the collision rates um, of people driving, so how frequently people get into collisions, so we get about just over 10 per 100 million kilometers driven. So this is a pretty rare event on how we rate just humans, so regular human drivers get into these sorts of collisions. Um, and their fatality rate is significantly lower um, here. So if we want to try to show that our autonomous vehicle is sort of being robust or doing better than human driving, we have to do sort of orders of magnitude more testing um, and hopefully on road to actually show that we're better than that human driver, um, which isn't really uh, something that is feasible for most people who are designing autonomous vehicles. Uh, Waymo can try, they can deploy lots of things, they can get those, those vehicles out, but again, it's very hard to really show on the real world that you're actually better than, than a human driver. So um, that's one thing. So because this sort of real world testing is not very feasible, Often, what people do is, again, as I've mentioned, we turn to simulation. So what we're going to try to do is say, okay, we can't deploy fleets and fleets of vehicles and get hundreds of millions of kilometers driving, but we can try and do this in simulation. So we can come up with some sort of relatively realistic simulation and see what we can do from there. So let's say I wanted to test, test my vehicle. I have some pretty nice simulator. Let's say I'm using something like Carla, and I design the scenario and I test it a bunch of times. So if I do that, let's say I have this pedestrian and this car, and we have them sort of um, coming into this interaction, we want to make sure that this system is overall safe. So I can basically run this simulation, I can design everything I want, uh, and sort of come up with some, some idea of how safe this, this system is, 
And again, this is assuming that I can sort of have this simulation and I can query it and sort of test it, test it from there. The problem is um, that there's this common saying um, that simulations are doomed to succeed. So the problem is I'm the one who's both designing the system and I'm the one who's designing this, this simulator. Eventually I'll be able to get it to work the way I want it to. So it's very easy to sort of trick yourself into thinking that this system is going to work exactly the way I want it to um, a lot. And there's a number of different reasons for this. One, um, because we are the ones sort of designing these models and designing these simulations, again, we're just going to kind of encode it with, with our own biases. And again, things are often much nicer in simulation than actually in, in the real world. Um, the other thing is just very hard to actually come up with a good way to search the space. If you're just doing sort of random sampling or just running your simulation, you're just going to sort of get an idea of average behavior, which again, is something that you've sort of encoded. So as a little example, um, let's say I wanted to sort of come up with a bunch of test cases. So one thing you can do is come up with a bunch of uh, sort of test cases or test, what they call a test matrix. So if we have something like two vehicles, I could define a few variables that I want to sort of sweep over, say, um, like the speed between these different cards, the different distances and whatnot. And I could sort of come up with my test case um, here. So even this where I only have three variables that I'm trying to sort of sweep over, and I have some discretization that I'm sweeping over here, um, I'm going to have a ton of simulations here. So this is, even in this like little example, it's over 100,000 scenarios. So even though uh, I'm only doing a relatively small test, this is still quickly becoming infeasible. So even though I'm turning the simulation, which is much more efficient than real world testing, it's still getting to the point where I'm basically going to be basically uh, swimming through data that I don't know what to do with it, and maybe it's not that useful, okay? And as a sort of another example, maybe we can make it a little bit more complicated and go back to that scenario um, that we were showing before, where we have a vehicle that's approaching this pedestrian. Um, I could do something like come up with a model of how I think this human is going to behave and some, do something like sweep over different velocities, kind of like in this test case approach. So I can propagate this forward and sort of see how this car interacts with this different um, pedestrian here. Um, but this isn't really capturing uh, realistic human behavior. So one thing we can do is we can start augmenting things like this model of how we think this human is going to behave and start sort of building up from there so we can have more interesting test cases here. So say we add some lateral movement, we can start sampling, sampling this way um, here. So we can start sort of getting more, more weird behavior. But again, one thing that's very hard, and again, because we are designing these simulations, it's unclear if this is really capturing real behavior. So maybe we'll miss something like a weird motion like this. And it's kind of unclear. Maybe this is something that is very useful to test. Maybe it's something that's not, okay? So that's one of the things that's sort of very challenging about this is it's just hard to know what is a meaningful test and how we can sort of efficiently get to, to points like this. The other thing that's very hard here is we're just looking at this sort of two, two case. As with this example, we're only looking at things like three variables. And as we get to more and more realistic um, situations, like say we add other vehicles that then have their own decisions, um, things get really, really complicated. So we have this combinatorial explosion of all these different scenarios we need to test and whatnot. So really what we want from this though is a tool that can help us search through this simulation and help us more effectively basically find things like the most likely failure. So for example, maybe we just sort of get into a collision with this pedestrian and we want to make sure that we're robust or sort of can be safe against these sorts of actions. So that's where we're going to turn to this tool called um, adaptive stress testing, which again will hopefully help us more efficiently search through the simulation and help us sort of get to that point where we can very quickly and very easily sort of find relevant and interesting failures in our system, which again should give us more insight to how the system sort of actually behaves. So um, in adaptive um, stress testing, um, which came out of Sizzle, Sizzle by Rattuli, um, we basically assume that we have this simulator. So as before, we have our autonomous vehicle scenario. We kind of set some things up. We can basically query this, this simulator here. From this, we have some states um, or observations. This is going to go into a reward function and an RL solver. So what we're going to do in this is we're going to uh, basically use RL and RL solvers to help us basically efficiently search through this, this space. 
So we're going to take advantage of these tools and these solvers and machine learning, and again, basically help us quickly search search the space to find something that will sort of maximize this reward and guide us towards this adversarial um, policies that basically give us these failure cases. So we're basically going to use this as an efficient search um, engine here. And um, here, um, basically what this RL solver is going to do, it's going to produce a policy a policy that will basically augment um, environment actions. So this is going to be basically control different things in our environment. For example, it could be this pedestrian, it could be noise in our sensors, and again, help us drive, drive the system towards, towards failure. So a lot of this basically comes down to how we actually use this reward function here and how we tune that to basically guide us and guide our simulation or our failure um, identification problem towards these most likely failures. So a lot of this comes down to how we actually define this function. And intuitively, basically what we want to do is we want to um, try to guide our system towards failure. So we give this um, system a penalty basically for not finding some failure. And we give it some penalty for taking unlikely actions. So we don't want totally crazy things um, for the pedestrian to do or for the environment uh, to do more generally. We basically want to find things that are more obvious or more likely to, to happen here. So a lot of it basically comes down to how we're going to guide and how we're going to search, um, search our system. Okay, so let's go back to this sort of more simple example and start sort of uh, breaking this down um, a little bit. So let's, um, for this example, we have this simulator again. So we have our system under test. So this is our vehicle that we want to try and find the failures in. Um, again, assuming that it's a relatively robust, uh, robust system um, here. Um, and we have some environment actions that we can start sort of probing and querying here. Um, so in this case, we're going to start uh, looking at the participant dynamics. In this case, this is basically the model or the actions that this um, pedestrian can take. So we want to start thinking, what are the different actions that this um, person can take and how can it affect my vehicle? Or can I be robust against basically these, these actions? And we'll also add some noise to the measurements here. So we can start basically um, giving some uncertainty to where we actually think the, the system is. And this will give us an idea of how robust or how, how much we can handle in terms of our perception uncertainty, which directly impacts um, our decision making here. Okay, so from this simulator, we have um, everything that comes to our uh, reward function, which is um, as defined before. We want to look at these sort of likelihood, um, the likelihood of our actions. Um, and again, trying to drive it towards these likely, likely failures. And we have this um, solver. Um, in theory, you can use pretty much any RL solver. You just need to sort of search this space and try to maximize that reward. Uh, one thing that we do a lot in my lab is we use Monte Carlo tree search. Because one of the nice things you can get is you can kind of get things like risk curves out of it. it. Gives you a little bit more insight and a little bit more interpretability. But in general, you can use um, any, any solver. Okay, so now we have this tool. We have adaptive stress testing. We have this whole system and we actually want to run it. Okay, so let's um, think a little bit about what, what we actually get out of this, this system. So again, if we were to just take our typical simulation, and we were to query it a lot, we'd probably get things that look like this. We have this sort of simulation, these systems that are basically just going to give us something, give us something close to average, average behavior. Now, if I were to just go for a pure adversarial, adversarial approach, where I just want to find a worst case example, I'd probably get something that looks like this, that I sort of hinted at before, where we just have this pedestrian, it's just running straight into the car. So we kind of can uncover this uh, suicidal pedestrian case, which yes, ideally, we would be able to avoid such collisions, but really when we think about it, it's not really this vehicle's fault here. So one of the challenges with um, a lot of these methods is you want to kind of balance things like what is the actual behavioral model that is guiding this, how adversarial or and how likely your um, issue actually is. So what we really want to do is try to find these relevant failures. For example, this, the pedestrian isn't acting particularly abnormal. Yes, they are sort of edging towards the, uh, the sidewalk here, but you can see we have a lot of um, detection noise and detection uncertainty and this kind of changes things. So this kind of failure is much more relevant, much more interesting in many ways to actually designing the vehicle than something like this, these sort of unavoidable cases. So, okay, we have this tool, we can find failures. Maybe we'll end up with something like this 
ideally we'll find something that's again more insightful like this. So the question is how do we actually get from here, say, to, to here? So pulling back on this slide, um, one of the big things here is um, everything is guided basically by this reward function um, here. And this, again, it guides our search process and it will ultimately produce different types of failure modes here. So um, one thing things that you can do is you can start thinking about how to shape or how to tune this reward function to, again, hopefully help you find things that are a little bit more relevant or interesting. So we can start thinking about how we can take things like domain expertise and incorporate this into the learning process. Um, since even we, as I guess we're all AI safety experts in this room now, or you will after this lecture and you'll have finished the class, uh, we want to figure out how you can take all that knowledge and again, hopefully start using, using this here. So um, there's a few different things that you can do and there's a few different things that we've, we've explored um, here. So um, for example, um, one thing that you can do is you can take things like um, the responsibility sensitive safety metrics, so RSS. This is a basically heuristics that came out of Intel Mobileye uh, that basically set sort of um, intuitive rules for how a vehicle should behave. And if you follow these rules, you'll never be at fault. So if we can start encoding this into this reward function, we can start finding things like more relevant um, failures. For example, um, something like this, where there's just sort of some weird misunderstanding and eventually we get into an accident. So this is sort of a weird dance. So let's look at a top-down view so we can maybe get a little bit more insight. And this will also show a few more agents involved. So in this case, uh, we have this sort of top-down view. We can see there's sort of this dance between pedestrians and, and the vehicle here, and it ultimately results um, in a collision. So this is something where we violated sort of our own sort of code of ethics through this RSS framework, and we've resulted um, in a failure here. So again, by adding this domain insight into that reward function, we can find things that are a little bit more, more interesting. Another thing that we can do is we can start adding things that can actually help the search um, itself. So one of the problems with using an RL framework is typically reinforcement learning is trying to find one single policy that is optimal. You want to control your robot to say walk across the room and you want to find that best, that best policy. The problem is, is when you're finding examples of failures, we don't really just want to find one failure, but we want to find many different failures. So one thing you can also do is start basically adding um, different um, things to this reward function to find a diverse set of policies. So then you can find lots of different failures. So for example, in this similar scenario where we have two pedestrians, which are the easiest things to make fail because pedestrians can do anything, we can actually find scenarios where we actually get into, oops, into situations where, where um, it's a collision between these two vehicles here. You can see here, there's some sort of weird behaviors we actually get rear-ended um, in this case. So by basically taking some sort of intuitive insights, and again, really thinking about how to design the reward function, we can start sort of pushing that domain insight into the failure search, and again, find more diverse and more relevant um, failures here. So this is sort of one, one thing we can do. Um, and the, what I've talked about thus far in sort of thinking about reward augmentation um, is very much, um, Still, we are engineers, we sort of have an idea of what we want. We either have our list of rules from RSS or we have some sort of clear idea of what we want from our policy. But this doesn't really tell us um, how we can sort of hand this to any person and maybe give something that's a little bit more intuitive in sort of the, the end result here. So one of the things um, we can do is start thinking about how we can do things like identify critical states and really think about how we can do this in a more general way to sort of generally get human insights to help guide, guide the search um, process. So one thing we can do is we can take, um, as I mentioned, this insight from critical states. So because it's sort of infeasible to really test um, over all, all different scenarios and whatnot, um, we want to try and see if we can sort of um, call this down into these sort of more key states, um, which we'll call these critical states, um, which hopefully will also capture these critical scenarios. And hopefully, since we're thinking about safety, these are things that are sort of near collisions or sort of um, tend to be accident prone or might be a little bit more risky. So there's um, a lot of work in um, sort of the human side of robotics that really try to understand sort of how people interpret critical states um, and what people think are important. 
And this has been shown to really help do things like build mental models. So if you can find these critical states, you can show this to people, and they can have a better understanding of how your system performs, which again is sort of what we're trying to do anyways, but through failure analysis. So what we can try and do is try to basically capture things like critical states, um, which might be things like um, approaching a red light, seeing how we do this, how we operate around pedestrians, um, and kind of look at these sort of, again, key scenarios and see if that can sort of help guide, again, all fail our failure um, situations. So to, um, to do this, we basically need ways to, again, find these critical states. And again, hopefully in a way that's intuitive. And then we can easily feed sort of into this validation or this search, search process here. So there's a number of different ways you can do this, sort of depending on what you have on hand. So one thing you can do is you can handcraft scenarios. So that's sort of what you can do in situations like this. You can basically take, again, your pool of experts and say, OK, these are the important situations. We can either set those up in simulation or try to encode them somehow. You can do this sort of by, by hand. Um, but again, this doesn't scale very well. We'll run into those sort of issues as I talked about um, earlier. Um, another thing that you can do is depending on the type of policy that your uh, vehicle is running or sort of the, the inner workings of how it's going, sometimes you can sort of peek inside and see if there's some insight you can get from the policy itself. For example, if you have some way to track uncertainty, you can take those states or those scenarios where your vehicle is uncertain and you can specifically look at those. Um, this is something that is not easy to do um, in general, but if you happen to have um, a vehicle or a policy that sort of follows something um, nice like this, then you can um, think about trying to encode that in. Um, similar to these handcrafted scenarios, if you have some sort of very specific heuristics or domain insights, you can start sort of putting that, that in directly, similar to what we did um, in the previous, previous slide and videos. Or what you can do is you can try to more directly sort of do something like human in the loop learning, where you can try and actually just sort of collect human data, collect the feedback from our experts, and see if we can use that to guide the search uh, itself. So this is one of the things we explored. So by having this tool that can help generate scenarios and generate things that may or may not be interesting, um, one thing that we can do is we can basically try to um, get a bunch of people to start labeling different scenarios as if they are critical or risky or not. So um, basically, we look at this onlooker's perspective. So we show the person some videos. So if I were to show you an example of a car driving, you could tell me if you think it's risky or not. And we can try and learn this human model and incorporate that into our search process. So we basically get a proxy for how risky you as people think that a system um, is. So we can both do this with something in simulation. And um, we can also do things like label different um, data sets um, that basically can tell us how critical um, a scenario is. And again, like I said, incorporate this into the search process. So we can basically um, continually collect more examples that may or may not be risky and hopefully learn, learn a good model. Um, in general, if you have a very good expert, this is great. If you don't have a good expert, this is noisy, so uh, it is a little bit sensitive here. But what you can do is you can start sort of collecting this sorts of insights and again, pushing your system towards these failures that tend to be a little bit more intuitively risky. So in this example, we'll look at this highway, highway scenario. So this is our test environment. So we have our green car and it is navigating this, uh, this environment um, here. It is basically just trying to go through the freeway without getting in collisions. So if you were to apply our heuristic methods um, as before, so just sort of the naive um, AST methods, we'll find failures that you might expect. So we can find um, this sort of getting very close or near collisions during a lane change um, or just when lane following. But basically all these failures basically look the same. And again, they kind of are intuitive because collisions, we all know what that is, um, but they're not very diverse um, and they might not sort of capture the full range of what we think is dangerous. Um, but if we start thinking about this sort of human in the loop um, approach, we still get these similar um, scenarios where we have this like loss of forward separation during the lane change or just in general, but we also get other types of risky behavior that aren't actually traditionally failures in the way we might, uh, might think. For example, we have this um, traffic cutoff. This is a risky behavior. It's probably something we don't want our vehicle to do too much. Um, but again, this is captured basically by this human insight um, here. 
Um, similarly, um, here, we just have this really close lane change um, as well, which is something that is not sort of traditionally captured um, in this, this sense um, here. OK, so what we've been talking about is basically this method for AST. So this is, again, it's this tool that helps us find these failures in relatively complex, um, complex systems here. And again, it allows you as designers uh, more than anyone else to sort of peek in to what's going on and again, sort of get some idea um, for your system. It can be a very sort of generic black box system. You just need to be able to simulate your system forward and again, have some idea of sort of what's going on on the inside um, here. One of the problems, as we sort of noted, you don't always get intuitive results. You tend to get something that might be a little bit crazy or a little bit out of the blue. Um, but using these different heuristics and these different approaches, we can find something that is much more relevant um, and interesting to us as the people trying to design these, these autonomous systems um, here. And again, this comes from insight from these domain experts. So we can kind of get an idea of what, what is risky here. So hopefully you can test, test your system out and then you will be uh, eventually brave enough so you can do things like uh, walk in front of a car. Let's see if it'll start over here. So you can fully test it before deploying it. So again, you can trust your grad students to, to let you walk in front of a car here. Um, and I guess since we're, we're all friends here, I would love to say that this worked 100% of the time, but it didn't. Um, occasionally, your students will still come very close to trying to run you over, albeit at a slow speed. But you know, it works most of the time. All right. OK. So. This is basically, um, for now, all I have to say about the simulation-based validation. And again, this is a tool that works very well in helping you find and understand these sorts of failures when you have this situation where you can model what's going on to some extent. You can kind of have your system that you can query, and you can kind of explore it in a relatively um, intuitive way. However, as I mentioned earlier, depending on the sort of structure of your environment and sort of what you actually know about your system, sometimes this is just not feasible. Um, and this is definitely the case um, in field robotics um, and in specifically agricultural robots, which is not as relevant of a robot uh, here at Stanford, but um, in Illinois, we are surrounded by cornfields, so it is much more prevalent of a problem there. So, okay, so um, now we're going to talk about um, anomalous failures in a slightly different context um, here. So to just give a little bit of a, a motivation, so um, these field robots that we'll be working with are basically part of this idea of trying to make um, agricultural fields uh, more autonomous. So a um, little fun fact, um, the agricultural uh, industry is actually one of the most dangerous um, in the US. Um, there are lots of issues that happen. A lot of it comes from just the dangers of working with uh, really big systems like silos, um, and in particular, really large robots like tractors, uh, which maybe some are robots, some are not, but becoming more autonomous. Um, so we work with these uh, relatively small robots um, here that are meant to go out into the field. Um, and ideally, you want them to robustly go up and gather data, perhaps perform some more uh, precision agriculture things and whatnot here. Um, but again, one of the big challenges is um, getting them to work in these kind of crazy field um, environments. Um, and we really want to get them to the point where they can start replacing these much larger, um, larger equipment, like tractors, which again, are very dangerous. And one of the things that we've been doing is trying to push basically how autonomous these, these systems can be. Again, kind of pushing this level of um, of autonomy up, and again, sort of pushing how, um, how capable they are. So one thing we can start doing first is starting to think about how we can make these systems more autonomous. One way we can do it is first by just sort of codifying what we need these systems to do. This is something that um, in autonomous vehicles, as I sort of hinted at before, we have this kind of idea of what we want them to do at different levels. We have these levels of autonomy um, for sort of what the expectations of the, of the vehicle are and sort of how we want them to operate. Um, and for field robots, you can actually make sort of parallels um, that are very similar, where you can start sort of making some parallels with what the robot should be able to do with respect to the human. So for example, in say like level one autonomous driving, you have partial automation, but you basically need to have your hands on the wheel. Um, similarly, if you have something for a field robot case, you might be able to monitor the robot, but you can basically sort of 
uh, be very close, but your hands off. And hopefully we can get to this point where you basically have this point where you don't have the person that needs to be there anymore. You just have these robots at, um, autonomous, autonomously operating. But again, to sort of get to this point, we can really get them operating at scale. We need them to be robust to these failures. And again, we can't necessarily use those same um, tools that we've been talking about because we don't have that same insight to the structure of the environment. So we'll show a few videos of the issues, but let's first look at a cream case so you get an idea of what these robots are doing. So we have these robots, they go up and down things like cornrows um, here. And for the most part, they're actually pretty good um, at doing this. And they're also small enough that they're not, uh, not too dangerous um, here. Um, I usually stop the video here because here you can see we sort of have this still one-to-one. -one. We don't quite trust the robots enough to just sort of be operating on their own. And that's because occasionally as they're going, they will get into some trouble. Perhaps there's too much mud on their wheels. There's something in the world and they will eventually fail. So, and again, this is sort of a cute failure. This is not catastrophic. But if you think about slightly larger autonomous robots, it actually gets very dangerous very quickly. Um, and especially with sort of the rolling out of larger equipment, it's sort of an issue. Now, one of the big challenges with this is the failures that you tend to find um, in these field environments are very unique. And again, like I said, they're very hard to actually sort of codify. When we think about autonomous driving, a collision is where we have two agents that have overlapped. Um, it's very difficult to actually detect things like collisions actually in the field. Um, you can come up with things that you might think will capture all types of failures, but they'll tend to fail um, in some cases. Like for example, if you think it has stopped, um, that means it's gotten into a collision, but sometimes its wheels will keep spinning, so you'll think it's moving and it's not. Um, you also don't really have access to good things like GPS, so you can have a really hard time telling if your robot's actually stopped um, or not. So again, one of the things that we're going to do is turn to some other, uh, other tools so we can try to identify failures. And we're going to do this uh, following us actually a fairly similar intuition to what we had before, where we have these sort of uh, similar issues where we have data imbalance, where again, we have these sort of high risk but low probability events. So most of our data that we get is actually normal driving data. So we're just going up and down the fields and we're pretty good at it. But occasionally we will find these sorts of failure systems or failure cases, um, and we'll only get a few examples of that. So we'll have lots of data about this, um, and very little, little here. So this is a very challenging problem in most, uh, most types of systems where we kind of have this sort of uh, flipped or sort of imbalanced data um, here where we have lots of this and we can learn a lot from sort of this sort of data. But again, we won't basically be able to capture much about this because we have so few examples relative to how much uh, good data that we have. But again, when we're thinking about things like failures, this is sort of the flip of what we, what we want. So this is the one that is like sort of much more important. And these, we sort of have this down, we don't really care about this, this as much. So we basically need to come up with ways. Again, we can start basically looking for these sort of anomalous events or these rare events and start um, sort of using that as a proxy for, for failures. So we're going to be sort of relaxing uh, this sort of true idea of a failure and just start looking for these sort of rare events. And maybe they're failures, maybe they're not. Chances are it's a, it's a failure, at least in our, our experience. So to just show um, some examples that maybe perhaps aren't quite as, as silly. Um, so here's an example of just normal driving through the field. So as you can see, uh, this is like normal, good, good situations. And I think this video also shows why it's hard to come up with a good simulation. This is something that's very, very hard to recreate. There's things like weeds in the way. You have uh, very odd lighting, very odd visibility. You basically are going through things like these leaves all the time. So this is the normal, normal driving case um, that for the most part is good and where most of your data um, comes from. Um, but we've sort of identified four different, different failures that tend to happen pretty frequently. So the first um, is a row collision. So this is similar to what, what we were showing before where you kind of just run into the edge here. And again, the thing to note um, from a perspective, uh, perception point of view, these don't look that different, right? So it's kind of hard to tell the difference between these two, two scenarios. Um, the two other common failures are running into um, untraversable obstacles. So this is obstacles, um, which yes, it is just hard to see sometimes. Um, there's something in a way, in this case, there's a plant stalk that is just in the way that we cannot push through. 
um, and that causes our robot to fail. So that's one, one thing. So it could be something like a stock, a weed, a grad student, all kinds of things here. Um, and the other case is this traversable um, obstacle here, where say there's something like in the way, but if you push past it or maybe sort of increase the torque, you actually could get over it. So it's a failure, but it's uh, recoverable. So these are some different cases that are pretty common. And again, we have some data for these, but not a ton. Uh, we have lots of data for this. So what we want to do is, again, we want to formulate this problem of failure identification. So we want to find the same thing as before. We want to find these issues where our system fails. But we're going to cast this as an anomaly detection problem. Okay? So basically, we want to find these uncommon events. And hopefully, we can categorize it as one of these sort of failure cases um, here. So the nice thing about this anomaly detection approach is it does inherently consider these concerns where we have this data imbalance, we have these sort of rare situations um, here. Um, and also because we are sort of already dealing with the fact that we have very little data and we don't have just unlimited resources with simulation, um, we can do things like we're okay with a small data set. And because these systems are actually tracked by a person for the most part, we can actually get labeled data that's just obtained by human intervention. So when the robot fails, we can label that on, online, and this can sort of help build up um, our data set. And again, hopefully this sort of helps us increase this autonomy by giving the robot some awareness of when it's encountered this failure. So this is more of an online approach than what we were talking about before, which is sort of a pre-deployment pre um, case. Okay, so the way we're going to do this um, is basically through um, some learning approaches. Since again, we have this data set um, and we can go from there. So one classic way you could do this is you can basically use a classifier. Um, this can be something that is very simple, um, like perhaps you want to gather some information about the distributions, you can do some hypothesis testing, um, or you can do something that's a little bit more advanced, like throw some machine learning at it, and again, you try and do something like throw a classifier at it, either as normal or not normal, or as one of the different test cases um, that we have. So that's sort of one, one way you can do it. That's an approach that some, some people use. Um, one of the things that's often very hard um, is because our perception input is most of the information that we have, um, it's very high dimensional. It's actually very tricky to sort of balance this with some other, other data. So that's something that is typically tricky um, with this sort of approach. Um, another common approach these days for looking at anomaly detection is actually to look at methods for reconstruction. So um, for example, uh, one common approach is to basically use an encoder decoder type approach. So you have your data, you have your observations, you basically um, pass this through your encoder, so you get a small latent space representation, and you try to reconstruct that same scene. So for example, I put in my uh, LiDAR point cloud, and I tried to basically re reconstruct it. And the assumption that people typically make with this sort of VAE type approach is if you have a good reconstruction error, so if you are able to reproduce this, this sample, it's probably something that is very well represented in your data set. So assuming you have a good model, assuming you can have some good, confident reconstruction, um, you can basically do a really uh, solid idea of just identifying what is normal and what, what is not um, here. Um, so that's one thing that you can do um, for this. Um, if you have something that isn't well represented in your data set, probably your model is not going to, a good job, going to do a good job reconstructing it. And in that case, it's likely an anomaly. So you can basically use a thresholding technique on your reconstruction here to try and, try and get this out. So one thing um, that we found is we can also get some more insight because we have this labeled data. Um, we can basically um, also label the data to get these different failures. So we can get a little bit more insight um, to what's going on. And this basically gives you a little bit more structured um, of, of a reconstruction. So again, here we have something like our LiDAR point cloud that's coming into this, um, say, feature generation. And we basically want to do something like perhaps reconstruct this, or again, ideally identify what kind of failure that we have um, here. So at runtime, what we're just going to do is we're just going to run this path where we have our data or our data from our robot. We're passing this in. We're trying to identify sort of what sort of state we're in. Are we in a good case or a bad case? And so quickly, we can look at um, sort of what, what sort of structures we get out of this. So one thing that's sort of interesting is we get something that's relatively interpretable out. So here, um, these are our point clouds here. 
And so we're just sort of looking at what's in our latent space. So we're trying to sort of see what sorts of scenarios we can capture through this encoder decoder um, type approach. So if we look at this first latent variable here, so one thing we can see here is we can kind of see this swing from right to left. So this gives us some idea of the orientation of the robot. And again, in sort of a vague, vague sense um, here. So this can kind of give us some idea of whether or not we're sort of centered or how we're adjusting to, uh, to the robot here. If we look at this um, other latent uh, variable here, we can see this basically says how close um, sort of these points are. So do we have something that is very sort of close to us? Is there something that's in front of us versus very open sort of uh, free space that's in front of us? So we get something that's sort of interpretable out. And again, we can actually get very good results in trying to identify these, these different scenarios. OK, but numbers are a little bit boring, so let's look at some videos um, here. So here's an example of um, this online detection. We have our LiDAR data input here, and we have our probability of the different types of scenes, um, scenes from here. So you can see we're pretty, pretty good at saying, OK, whether or not we're in normal, uh, normal operation. And when we sort of switch over to um, things like row collisions and whatnot here. So in this case, we sort of hit an obstacle, but we were able to get over it, and it detected this as, as traversable. OK, but these are still all things that sort of are similar to the video I showed before. Let's look at some real um, anomalies. So in this case, um, this is when a wild grad student appears who walks in front, and we're still able to detect that this grad student is not traversable. So we can detect um, things like that. Um, we can also look at things um, like trying to actively recover. So actually incorporating this into the control paradigm. So we can uh, say run into something like a roll collision. We can try to do something like a recovery maneuver. So we can try and back up the robot so it can basically try again, try to see if it can proceed um, forward here. And basically what it's going to um, identify after basically running into a plant a bunch of times is that this is probably not a row collision. It is probably just very stuck. So uh, we can see it will try one more time here and have a better idea of basically what is actually going on. And then it can do something like call for help from, from our human. OK, and since I'm running a little bit low um, on time, um, I'll just say a few more things. Um, so one thing that we don't actually like about this system is, yes, we can now detect failures, but it's after it happens. So in this video, this is actually what's happening to the robot. This is not something we ever want to be in. So just knowing that I'm in this state is not actually that useful or that informative. So often what we want to do is actually move towards proactive um, detection um, here. So what we have been trying to do is basically push this to, we actually can incorporate this into the planning process. So we're going to have an idea of sort of the risk over our planning horizon. So we can basically see, based on where we think we're going to go, whether or not we're in this sort of good zone, and if we're going to get into a collision in the future. So you can sort of be a little bit more proactive about stopping, stopping these failures and whatnot here. OK, and since I've been talking quite a bit, I will stop showing some videos um, here. And just note um, a few things about this um, here. So for these sorts of systems where, again, you don't necessarily have a good model of everything that's going on, um, you can use things like anomaly detection as a proxy for this failure identification. Um, and again, we talked about some methods um, that can basically help you identify this by looking at this data um, imbalance problem a little bit more directly. Um, and again, we can extend this to a predictive um, approach um, as well. But then one of the big questions is, now what? So, um, since this is an online approach, it's not as obvious what you're supposed to do with these failures. When we're looking at the autonomous vehicle approach, you want to fix it. You want to sort of, uh, as the engineer, try to design it better. Um, this, you're already out in the field. You sort of have it there. Um, one of the things you can actually do, though, is start thinking about how to actually connect it to the autonomy itself. So we can look at this sort of failure identification as a way to sort of give the robot more awareness so it can do things like call for help. So we've explicitly looked at basically how you can take these signals and these sort of online estimates of what's going on and try to do things like inform, inform the human um, what's going on. So um, again, that's uh, basically all I have. We talked about these two different scenarios where we have lots of some structure, not lots of structure, some structure in our environment and very little, and some different ways we can actually look at how to identify failures, again, to hopefully give us more insight as designers 
or just give the robot a little bit more insight to how it's, how it's doing. So I'd like to thank um, all my collaborators um, who did most of the work um, on all of this. And thanks for listening. So I'll take questions if there's time. Uh, go ahead. Uh, along with vision, is sound a reliable uh, signal for learning, especially for the organs driving? That's a great, great question. So I think the, the sound, um, it can actually, I, I'm not entirely sure for the autonomous driving case. Um, it's actually, it's very useful for robots like this though, like the smaller robots. Um, you can actually do things like listen to the wheel encoders and get a lot of information about what's, what's going on there. So there's actually a lot of insight you can get by like listening more directly to, to the robot. So there's some folks that look at that like for mobile robotics. I'm not sure about uh, vehicles. I think there's a lot of noise pollution depending on where you are, but probably is also useful. Yeah. Yes. How does it know whether to uh, go back and then try to kind of uh, go forward like one more time? Like it, it seems to repeat. It. Ah, yeah, so that's a great question. So we can go back to that video and I'll talk uh, talk over it a little bit more. Um. So. video to show. Okay, so in this case, um, so we have these different like classes uh, here. So if we are in the case where we have a row collision, we can actually sort of prescribe what we need to do. So if we know we are one way or another, so say we know we've gotten to a collision, say to the right, uh, we know with a high likelihood, if you back up and then sort of go forward again, uh, that will probably get you out of it. Um, so as long as this is the most likely mode that we think we're in, it'll basically keep doing that. So it's basically a, a prescribed set of actions based on what you think you're doing. So if you're in normal operation, it would just try to go forward. If it thinks it's in a row collision, it's going to try to do this sort of recovery, recovery maneuver. Um, similarly, if it were to say, think it was in the traversable mode, which is now gone, so it's just something like a small obstacle in front of it or something like a weed, um, it would just try to go faster, which is also not a great solution sometimes. <laughs> if you're wrong, that's quite bad actually. Um, but yeah, so it's basically just a simple logic based on where we think we are. Yeah. Yes. Except that you are co comparing the reconstructed image with the original image, right? Yes. Uh, how does that comparison work? Do you do that in the like, for example, for the images in the pixel space or in the latent space? Good question. So uh, you do it in the pixel space, mm -hmm. or um, depending on what you're doing, you can do it in like the lidar, point cloud mm -hmm. space, and whatnot. And the the there's two things that are tricky about that. One, uh, there are tons of different metrics that you can use. So you can use uh, things like a pixel-wise or point-wise error, uh, which can cause issues, but is relatively straightforward. Or you can do things like image similarity and whatnot. Um, so just choosing that uh, just becomes sort of a try a bunch and see what works best. Um, the other thing that's hard about, um, if you were to just look at that reconstruction um, error, you have to pick a threshold at some point. Um, and in general, Picking thresholds is always hard, and it's going to give you some, some errors um, there. So part of um, that reason is why we actually look at like this, this branch here. Mm -hmm. So instead of us explicitly saying, okay, like if the error is more than 0.1, it's, it's an, anom an anomaly, uh, we go through this classifier, which is basically coming up with that heuristic for us. So it's basically uh, learning itself what the different modes are based on, on what we're extracting. So, uh, I guess the short answer is depending depends on which part you want to do. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I think we'll have to wrap up there, but let's thank our speaker again.